All right, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring this out in real time. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, nine o'clock service went just like we had pre- pre- prepared and planned and all that kind of thing. And uh, I don't know, just over through that time of worship and in those moments, God just kind of took me back. Uh, as you know, we have, we're, in, we're in the middle of camping season with our, with our student ministry, and our middle schoolers were at middle school camp all of last week. Our high schoolers leave out today, and uh, between services, we got to pray over them and, and just ask God to move, and I actually got to go out there this week and spend some time and to pray, and all of that just combined with even the text that we're in this, moment, in this morning just kind of stirring up memories in my heart that I haven't let my mind go to in a while. Uh, I remember the moment I gave my life to Jesus. I don't know if you remember yours, and I'm not saying that, that you have to. You know, some of you grew up in the church, and you, know, you, you don't know a time in your life when you didn't believe in Jesus. But some of us, that, that's not our story. And, and maybe God saved you out of some really, really dark things like the man we're going to look out today. And, and I'm kind of maybe somewhere in the middle. Uh, most of you guys know, if you're new to our church, if you, um, you're going to hear some things for the first time. If you've been in our church, you're about to hear a story you've heard a thousand times. I don't care. You're going to hear it anyway. Uh, I grew up in the church. My dad pastored for 40 plus years. Mom and dad were in ministry their whole lives. And uh, retired right before we came up here to start Vintage. And, uh, so I grew up in the church. I've been exposed to Jesus my entire life. Like, I, can't, I can't remember not knowing about God, but I remember the moment that I chose Jesus for myself because it was at the camp that we're going to be at this week. Uh, Preston and I are going to be out there with our high schoolers um, all week. And it's 1992. I was 14 years old. The theme of the camp was living for the moment. I still, I still got the t-shirt somewhere. It don't fit me anymore. I got a little bit more here than I did when I was 14. Testify somebody. All right. uh, but I'll never forget it, man. I'm sitting in the rally that night. And this was back before they have all the stuff now. They used to do the rallies in the lodges over there, if anybody's familiar with that camp. And the worship's happening, the speaker's speaking. And I just remember sitting in that room thinking, like, I need to get out of here. I just need to get out of here. I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell you what he was speaking about. I can't tell you a single song that was sung that night. But I, I remember the Holy Spirit, thick as I'd ever felt him in my entire life. And I just thought, I, I just need to get alone with God. I don't, I don't need anybody to talk to me. I don't need anybody to lead me in a prayer. I just need to go be alone with God. And I got up and I walked out of the lodge and I went in there and on, on the camp is, is a, a pool house and leading down to the pool house is a set of concrete steps. And I remember sitting on that top step, just me and the Lord and just talking to God. Just knowing there were some things in my life that, that weren't where they needed to be and what they needed to be and, and just... God didn't really feel real. You ever had those moments where you, you know he exists, but you're not sure if he's real? That sounds crazy. Can, do you, know, you know what I'm talking about? You know he exists, but he just doesn't feel real. Or maybe a better way to put it, just doesn't feel like personal to you. And I said, God, I just, I need you to be real in my life. And I remember just tears flowing. Y'all know I cry at anything anyway. You laughed a little too hard, Morgan. That's all right, though. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Us emotional people, right? We're emotional people. And uh, just tears flowing down my face. And I, I just knew something was different in that moment. I was 14 years old. My kids today go out there at age 15, and they, they know Jesus much better than I did at 15. Sometimes I wish I was as spiritually mature at like 25 as they are at 15. But do you remember that, do you remember that moment where God changed your life? And 
Maybe it's your salvation experience. Do, do you remember that moment? Can, can I just invite you back into it? Step back into it for a second. Because you, you can get so far from it, you forget how miraculous it is. You can be saved so long that you lose the wonder and beauty of how drastically God has shown up in your life and changed you. You can get so far into who you are now that you forget who you were then and you can't see and appreciate the space that's, that's created and how much you've grown and how much work God has done and how much he's changed you. And, and can you just join me in praying for these kids that are gonna be out there this week? And like they need something pivotal in their lives. They, need, they don't need an emotional experience. They need a pivotal spiritual moment in their lives that maybe sets a new trajectory for their lives that would not happen otherwise. When they get away from school, they get away from normal routine, they get away from their freaking phones and step into a space where they can just find the spirit in a way that they normally can't and he would fall on them. That same camp is where I surrendered to a call to ministry. God has just done so much there and I just want, I'm just praying, my heart just aches for something to happen this week in the lives of these kids that will be powerful and life-changing. And and as weird as it sounds, it it is connected to what I want us to talk about this morning. And, and I really want our, the people that are in the room that maybe, maybe spiritually you've just gotten into a rut. Anybody ever been like in a spiritual rut? You know, I mean, it doesn't mean like you're, you're, you, you've drifted from God and you're sinning and all these kind of things. I'm talking about you just feel dry. And God just, again, seems I went from like, God, you, I know you exist, but are you real? I know you real, or you're real, but you just seem distant. And just to press in of the power of what God can do. I think our kids going off to camp combined with the moment that we're looking at in Scripture today kind of just taking me back to this moment because today we're going to look at a story. We get to watch a man get saved. We, need to lean, we get to lean into a part of the book of Acts where, where we see a, a personal salvation story. We've been walking through the book of Acts over the last several weeks, and, and you know what? For the most part, we see these big swells of spirit moving, like Peter stepping out on Pentecost and preaching the gospel and calling people to repentance and baptism and 3,000 people getting saved and baptized. This moment when this lame man's legs are healed and God leverages that miracle to get people to be open and pay attention to the gospel and thousands more come to Jesus. These this swell of movement happens. And then we stepped into Acts 6 and 7, watching this man, Stephen, who was one of those who had come to salvation, who now is standing in front of this group of uber religious people that are furious at his faith in Jesus. And he stands in front of them and he speaks truth and he calls them out. And he says, y'all, the Holy Spirit is right here moving among you. And you're as stubborn and hard-hearted as all the generations before you. And you're missing it. He calls them stiff-necked. And his stiff-necked adjective for who they are ends up with them picking stones up in their hands and pelting him with rocks until he dies. And in that moment, in that scene, we're introduced to a man named Saul. A man who we get to know of because we get to know him on the other side of all this, a man named Paul who became, went from persecutor to planter, from enemy to instrument, to a man determined to squash the movement that Jesus was a part of, to the biggest champion of it perhaps the world has ever known. But how he, co- how he goes between those two things is miraculous, and it's powerful, and it contains elements that can teach us something. That you, when he goes from enemy to instrument, from persecutor to planter, there are things that happen in that space that have to happen in all of us in order to be used by God. And it begins with this salvation moment when in Acts chapter 9, go ahead and go there. We're just going to go all the way into Acts chapter 9. We're going to skip some of this other stuff. 
I was going to do because we're just going a different direction. It's Acts chapter 9. At this point, we know Paul as Saul. And he has decided that, that he will take personal ownership for stopping this church thing from continuing on. He goes to the high priest and he says, give me a letter of permission to go into every town. And if I find anybody in that town that claims to believe in Jesus, let me lock them up. Let me put them in chains, drag them off and throw them in prison. So that's what he would do, y'all. This wasn't G-rated. This was violent, crazy times in the life of the church. Saul would walk in with his entourage and he'd travel into the city and he'd go beat on the doors. Any Christians living up in here? Yes, we believe in Jesus. Boom, let's go. Lock them up dragging, kicking, screaming if they had to, and people were continuing to profess faith in Jesus even though they knew that the threat was prison and possibly even death. So Paul's next stop on this persecution pilgrimage is a city called Damascus. And when he heads down this road to this city, he has no idea when he takes his first steps that this would be the moment that would change everything for him. It's Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 3. You ready for the word of God? Say amen together. Come on, let's go. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. It says, as he, Saul, traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, who are you, Lord? Paul said, I am. I'm Jesus, the one you were persecuting. Verse six, but get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but not seeing anyone. Verse eight, Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. So they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus, and he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. And in that moment, everything changed from Saul of Tarsus, that he is going to a city expecting to do one thing, and he will end up doing another because on the way, Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. I'm talking about, I'm asking you to remember that moment when Jesus showed up. It may be today for somebody in the room. He's traveling down the road, and I love how Paul comes to salvation. Throughout most of the, remember, we looked at this story last week in Acts chapter 8, where Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, this man, Philip, gets into this chariot, and he explains Jesus to this Ethiopian through, through Isaiah 53. You know who saves Paul? Jesus himself. You ever met somebody like, Jesus himself going to have to save you. Like, that's what it's going to take. And that moment is the moment that changed the trajectory of Saul's life forever. First of all, it's a reminder, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's a reminder that nobody is beyond God's reach. Nobody. See, we realize this in our little sterile environment of thousands of years later, but for For this man who was violently killing Christians, you couldn't have been further from God in this season of his life. And now Jesus shows up and look at me, nobody is too far gone. There's some people in the room, you think that you got so much junk in your past, so much brokenness and bitterness and sin and evil and wrongdoing that you feel like there's no way God could ever redeem you, restore you, reconcile you, and use you. Everything about this book tells me otherwise. Listen to me. If he can save Saul, he can save you. If he can change him, he can change them. If he can change them, he can change them. Maybe it's not you. Maybe there's somebody in your life. Maybe it's your son. Maybe it's your daughter. Maybe it's your uncle or your cousin. Maybe it's a friend, a coworker. There's somebody that you think, and you're so concerned and so broken because they seem so far from God, you don't know how they will ever come to faith. Let Saul be a reminder of what God can do. 
and who he can reach. Don't stop praying. Don't stop looking for windows of opportunity to have conversations. Don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. Don't give up. But then there's some things that happen on the other side of salvation. For Paul, that I think are some of the same things we have to navigate. Because see, what, what, he had to, what he had to deal with in this transition, okay, so now he's saved. And he's, he goes from, again, enemy, instrument, persecutor, planner. Like that seems like a big gap to kind of close. But what he experiences in this season are the same things I think that we have to be ready to expect on the other side of salvation. That there's, some, there's certain things that no, no matter who you are or when you get saved, there are things that come along with the other side of salvation that you have to manage well to keep moving forward and stepping in purpose. You with me say amen. For Paul, it's almost immediate. Look at verse, drop down to verse 10. It says, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied, get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to this house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. Verse 12, in a vision, he has, been, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias said, I've heard of this dude. I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Paul's in this city, blind, can't see, don't, doesn't, isn't eaten for three days. And the way that he's going to be delivered from this and moved into the next space is God goes to a man named Ananias. Ananias is like, Lord, I've heard of this cat. <laughs> I, I've heard of this man. I know what he's about. Write this down. See, Paul, his sin was forgiven, but his reputation was not erased. His sin was forgiven, but his reputation was not erased. And now he's got to navigate that reality. Can anybody relate? You know you met Jesus. You know you had a salvation experience. You know you want to live for the Lord. You know when to give yourself to him. But there's a lot of people who know who you were and like to remind you of it. Oh, I thought I'd hit somebody. Y'all got, got a bunch of holy people in the room. Can I find somebody with a past in the room? Well, you know your sin is forgiven, but your reputation is still there. That's something that you have to figure out how to navigate with grace. First of all, Ananias had every right to be a little bit hesitant of Paul. Come on. <laughs> I mean, listen, who knows? Maybe Ananias had a family member who Paul had put in prison. And so for Paul to act like, dude, you should just forgive me and everything should be fine. Okay. <laughs> See, when we step into these spaces on the other side of salvation, how we navigate the reputation that we've built over time is really important. For us to expect or act like there isn't some hesitancy or some fear or a lack of trust from people that we hurt is really unrealistic and unfair. Come on. And we have to live, listen, we have to figure out how to manage the tension of who we know we were and who we desire to be and understand that there's some time in that space that requires grace from both parties. It's really good preaching. I hope it's sinking in. His sin is forgiven, but his reputation was not erased. When you meet Jesus... And you ask for forgiveness and you repent, listen to me, he forgives. He erases your, he, he forgives your sin. But when you step back into those old places that knew who you were, your reputation will still be there. 
And how you navigate that space is really important. And my prayer is we learn how to navigate it with grace from us and for us as we walk forward. Because this is a pivotal moment. Number one, Ananias is very right in having a little bit of hesitation knowing who he was. Especially as fresh as it is in the moment. But thank God for men who are willing to walk in obedience to God. Verse 17. It says, Ananias went in and entered the house, and he placed his hands on him, on Paul, on Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once, like scales, things like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up, and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength, and Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the Son of God. There's so much really cool things right in that passage. Number one, did you notice what Ananias called him? Brother, that you just met Jesus, but you're already part of the family. I know you got a past, but so do we all. Amen, somebody. He says, brother. And he lays his hands on him. And it says he got up and he was baptized. I wonder if, was Ananias the one that baptized him? And how many people thinking, who is Ananias baptizing? Is that who I think it is? No, it can't be. Surely he wouldn't be going through the waters. Does he know who he's baptizing? Because y'all know nobody in church ever act like that. (laughs) But then, would would you go back to verse 20? It says, immediately he, Paul, Saul, began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the son of God. That word immediately just jumped out at me this week. Immediately. See, it would have been really easy for Saul to think, you know what, with all that I've done and with everybody still looking at me for who I used to be, everybody's reaction is going to be like Ananias' reaction when they first hear about this. So maybe I just should maybe sit back, sit in the shadows, sit on the sidelines and just kind of play a secondary role and just kind of sit back and be quiet for a while. But no, what does it say? It says, immediately, immediately he starts to share, even though he has a reputation, even though he has a past, even though there's still so much about Jesus, he probably doesn't even yet fully understand. He he begins to go and say, this Jesus who I persecuted, I'm now convinced he is the son of God. And it reminded me of this reality. Maybe you want to write it down. Just because you have a lot to learn doesn't mean you don't have something to share. Just because you have a lot to learn doesn't mean you don't have something to share. You don't have to have 600 letters at the end of your name and 15 degrees on your wall to share Jesus. You don't have to be an expert biblical scholar to share Jesus. You don't have to know everything there is to know about God because look at me, you never will. You will never know all there is to know about God, but you are an expert in what he's done in your life. Share that. Start there. Share that. Start there. Just because you don't know all this stuff yet, just because you haven't figured it all out, just because you feel like you don't know all the Bible that you want to know and hope to know, doesn't mean you should just sit silent and wait to tell somebody about the saving grace and power of Jesus you've experienced in your own life. Just because you have a lot to learn doesn't mean you don't have something to share. Look at me. I think every one of us has something to share. You've got a story that God wants to use. You've got moments in your life that other people need to hear about. People come to me all the time. Well, I... I just don't feel like I have it together enough yet to start talking to people about Jesus. When are you gonna? That's like waiting until you have enough money to have a kid. 
just doesn't happen. I just feel so imperfect. I'll say it again. If God can only use perfect people, he doesn't have anybody to use. (laughs) If God can only use perfect people, he doesn't have anybody to use. It says he immediately, listen, just because you have a lot to learn, and we all do, that doesn't mean you don't have something to share. I know, I have people come to me all the time, Matt, would you, would you come talk to my cousin or come talk to my uncle about Jesus? I'm like, and you know, my first question is, have you talked to him about Jesus? Well, I'm afraid he's gonna ask me that question. I don't know. Me too. <laughs> me too. You know him. You have a relationship with them. You know what God's done in your life. Share it. Share who he is, who you know he is, what he's done for you, the grace and mercy that you've experienced and the power of his presence in your own life. Share that. Just because you have a lot to learn doesn't mean you don't have something to share. And Paul starts sharing it, y'all. Look at it. Verse 21 says, all who heard him were astounded and said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for all those who called on the name, on, on this name? And came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests. But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. People couldn't believe it. Hey, isn't that, dude that, isn't that, that guy I went to high school with? Didn't I used to work with her? Didn't the, isn't this who they used to be? And now it seems like there's somebody. Like, I want us to get so radically changed by Jesus, it confuses the mess out of the people who used to know us. There's something so different about who we were that the people that knew us BC before Christ don't understand how radically different we've become because that's what happens when Jesus really gets a hold of your life. It changes you. It changes what matters. It changes, your, it changes so much of who you are in all the best ways possible. And that's what's happening to Paul, and people are so confused. And it says he grew stronger, and he kept confounding them. And he sees he's proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He's doing with the Jewish people the same thing that Jesus tried to do. Hey, look at this Old Testament that you guys value so much, and let me show you where Jesus is in all of it. And, y'all, there were a group of people that didn't like it because when you change... For Jesus, when you become who you are intended to be instead of who you used to be, there'll be a group of people that you used to hang out with that don't like you anymore. That might be the best thing I said all day. There'll be a group of people that don't understand it. And this group of people is the group for for Paul in this day are the group of people that he used to run around with killing Christians. And now they're like, dude, you're a traitor. So you know what? We're going to kill you. And that's literally what they try to do. They start conspiring to kill Saul. So much so the disciples have to put him in a basket and put him through the wall to get him out of the city. So he basically flees to Jerusalem for his own life. But when he gets there, what he experiences with the church is what far too many have experienced, I'm afraid. Look at verse 26. It says, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe that it was for real. But Barnabas, verse 27, however, took him in and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Do you see what just happened? He shows up at the church and his reputation precedes him and it doesn't seem that he's welcome. Now, I know y'all would have a hard time believing that anybody would ever walk into a church and not feel welcome. But just work with me here, okay? I had the same problems then that we seem to far too often have now. Here's a man, his life has been changed, but it's fresh and it's new and he tries to stay. Remember, apparently he wasn't able to because it says he tried. That means he attempted and it wasn't successful until somebody like Barnabas steps in. That unfortunately that he shows up at the church, but because of what he had done and who he had been, unfortunately he was not welcome there. Man, we're really bad about doing that, huh? 
Thank God for people like Barnabas. Thank God for Barnabases in the church that say, yeah, I know who he was, but I also believe in who he is. You ever had anybody who knew who you were, but started to believe in who you is? Who you're becoming? Somebody who knows your past, but sees the potential of your future? Somebody who knows what you've done, but believes in you anyway? Who has the grace and patience to walk with you, to encourage you, to hold you accountable, to mentor you and disciple you into who you're supposed to be? We all need a Barnabas. We all need a Barnabas. But you know what I think of? How different this could have gone. How personal Paul could have taken this and how it could have very easily soured him on the church and we would have never seen the church planter that we have now. Because we all know people and maybe you are some of those people until today that you had that experience in church. You said, I ain't never going to church again. Because it's so easy, he could have so easily gotten so bitter. This is what I want to say to you. Write this down. Don't let the reactions of some cause you to be resistant to all. That as you experience salvation and this new life with Jesus and start walking down this new narrow way pursuing him, just listen to me. There are going to be people that call themselves Christians that come at you in the most harsh, judgmental, unloving mean ways possible. Don't let the reactions of some cause you to be resistant to all because you need the body of Christ. You need the church. You need people. You need community. And if you let the reactions of some cause you to paint the entire church with the same brush, you'll miss out on being a part of something that you desperately need. Don't let the reactions of some cause you to be resistant to all. Paul was embraced, and luckily, a man named Barnabas stepped into his life and discipled him. And Paul would grow, and he would develop, and he would experience all these powerful things. And he would even talk about what he did on the other side of salvation to grow in his faith and to get to know Jesus. Because look at me, salvation is just the beginning. Oh, I need, a, I need an amen. Salvation's just the beginning. It's the starting line. It's not the destination. Come on. I mean, it's, 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 it's the starting line of this thing. That he, salvation leads to transformation through the power of discipleship, God's word, the Holy Spirit, and God moving in your life. And Paul kind of speaks into his discipleship and what he did and how, what he leaned into on the other side of salvation. But he tells it to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1. Flip over there with me. Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 15. Paul looks back years later and he recounts all the things that he did in this space. He says, but when God, verse 15, but when God who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I didn't immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas. Remember, y'all, that's Peter. Often when Paul's writing, he calls Peter Cephas. And I stayed with him for 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other, other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I declare in the sight of God, I'm not lying I'm not lying in what I write to you. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches that are in Christ. They simply kept hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy. And he, they glorified God because of me. Why do I read that? Because I want you to notice all the intentional steps he took to grow. He says, I, di I didn't immediately do certain things, but I went into spaces where I could get around other believers in order to be able to solidify my faith in Jesus. That I spent time with Peter and I spent time with James and I went back in for three years before I stepped out preaching the gospel. I sat in the word of God and in pursuit of God in order to be able to walk in the purposes of God. And that's something that you have to remember on the other side of salvation. Yes, walk in in purpose, but stay in pursuit. Walk in purpose, but stay in pursuit. That, the that moment on the Damascus road when he met Jesus, 
was just many times he would meet with Jesus. More than just when the Spirit came and changed your life. And when I sat on concrete steps and experienced salvation, man, the times I've had with Jesus along the way where he's... I would love to tell you that I got saved on those concrete steps at Victory Mountain Camp at 14, and I was the perfect Christian from that day. But that would be a lie. And you know, I post a lie, especially in church. That was just the beginning And I'm still walking in purpose, but I'm staying in pursuit. Go read it. Go read Philippians 3. And just just, just read Philippians 3 sometime this week, where Paul talks about all that he walked away from on the other side of salvation. But now what he gets in pursuit of Jesus, not in pursuit of doing things for Jesus, but in pursuit of Jesus himself. That Paul on that day was radically changed. That on the other side of salvation, he stepped into the things necessary in order to grow into his purpose. But let me, one last thing, then we're done. Paul never forgot, never forgot who he used to be in the best way possible. Like there was a, there was a, there was a little bit of a seed in him remembering who he was so he could see how he was now because of Christ. When he writes to Timothy, go with me there. One, one more scripture and then we're done, y'all. Listen, For, it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And, and, and keep in mind, as, as you're turning there or looking it up, this is one of the last things Paul would write was this letter to, these letters to Timothy. He's moving toward the end of his journey. And I think he's looking back and he's reflecting on what he's experienced. And he says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. This is the one you underline. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this season so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. On the other side of salvation, you need to know your sin will be forgiven, but your reputation will not be erased, and you're going to have to figure out to navigate the tension of those things. You need to know you have something to share, and that just because you have a lot to learn doesn't mean you shouldn't share it. Don't let the reactions of some people that maybe are a part of the church or claim Jesus cause you to resist it to the body of Christ that you get to be a part of. But every now and then, remember how far you've come. This is the way I'll put it. Only look back to be reminded how far you've come. That every now and then, Paul would just look over his shoulder and say, yeah, I've come a long way. Thanks be to God and his grace. Would you stand with me? Just again, just, let's enter into a time of prayer. We're going to worship one more time and we're going to get out of here. I just wonder, you know, like Paul thought he was going to Damascus for one reason, but God showed up and it turns out he ended up in Damascus for a different reason. He ended up, instead of killing Christians in Damascus, he was discipled by Christians in Damascus. I don't know why you came here today, but maybe why you came is not why you came. Maybe you just came because you're trying to honor your dad and Father's Day and just wanted to get him off your back for a minute. Or maybe, I don't know. But maybe today's your Damascus Road moment where you just let Jesus in. You just submit, surrender to him, see him for who he is and allow him to have your life. Or maybe there's something that struck a chord in your spirit that we've learned from Paul and what he had to deal with on the other side of salvation that 
you need to navigate a little bit better, a little bit more grace, a little bit more strength, a little bit more wisdom. Or maybe you're here today and you got, you got a BC Saul in your life. Somebody that you know they're so far away from Jesus and your heart's so heavy for them and you just wanna pray one more time that somehow, some way, God would break through and grip their heart. We're gonna worship as we do, however you feel led. If you wanna sit and pray or come and kneel and pray or grab a friend and pray, just follow the Spirit's leading. God, I pray that right now that we would just allow this to be a holy, reverent moment where we let you work. God, thank you for the examples in Scripture we have of what you can do in the lives of people who will surrender themselves to you. God, thank you for the story of Saul. Thank you for allowing us to have so much detail in it, God. God, thank you for the reminder that we're never beyond your reach, that you can save even, as Paul calls himself, the worst of sinners. And use us for your glory. And God, I pray that you would just give us wisdom as to what we need to do in this moment. Your head's bowed, eyes closed. If you feel led to come and kneel and pray, I'm just going to go ahead and invite you. Just come on, just come. Whatever's on your heart, come lay it before the Lord. Seek Him. Talk to Him as we worship.